Lord, we thank you for bringing us here today. As we go into your word and as we go into this chapter, let us realize that there's some momentous stuff going on in this chapter, God. Uh, Let us not simply be puffed up with knowledge, though, so that we know a lot of stuff about 1 Kings 8, but let us leave here being better equipped to serve you, God. And let us see what Solomon did right, and let us prepare for what Solomon's going to do wrong so that we can find out places in our own life where we might be following in his same path and where we could do better, where we, are, where we could be doing worse. Uh, and ultimately, God, just shape us to be more and more like you. We love you, God, and we praise you. We give this time to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We got a long chapter ahead of us today. Uh, but the good thing is that we've already covered 21 verses of it. Because uh, two weeks ago, uh, we did a big recap of chapter 7, and that's mainly because it was my fault that I accidentally forgot to click record when we actually went through chapter 7, which was really disappointing because we had a great discussion over it. But two weeks ago, what we did is we did a recap of chapter 7 for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then we spent the next hour and a half covering the first 21 verses of chapter 8. Today, we are going to cover the back 45 verses, right? Uh, chapter 8 is a very long chapter. Uh, and because of that, what we're going to do is I'm just going to summarize the context very briefly. Uh, and fortunately, all of us in this room have kind of been with us this whole journey. Uh, so I don't have to go super in depth into the context, but I do like to give context just for the people who are watching online. Um, and so I'll cover that briefly so that we can hop into it. Yes, sir. Is it on this time? Just... Well, it's, it's recording. Yes, it is. Thank you okay. for checking. Uh, I, make sure. And I even have a fail safe now to where I'm recording it in two different ways. Um, just to be careful. Um, but you know what? One day I'll probably miss both of those. And so none of us are perfect. You live and you learn it again and again until you get it right. To quote the famous sage, Hannah Montana. Um, okay, so the context behind this is that we are in the united monarchy of Israel. The people of Israel have been freed from bondage. They have wandered through the wilderness. They have gone into the promised land. They have gone through the period of the judges where everybody was doing what was right in his own eyes. And they are now in the period where there are kings. Right? King Solomon, not very good. King David, very good, but flawed. King Solomon, also very good, but also very flawed. Right? Um, David was really good in a spiritual manner, right? Even though really his kingdom like was like he, he really didn't see the kingdom to the height of prosperity from a physical perspective, mainly because he was so focused on establishing the kingdom. Right? David, whenever he showed up, he was a spiritual powerhouse, but really his life was a life of warfare. Solomon, though whose name literally means, like, peace, right, Shlomo, right? Well, he is a man of peace, right? So he is not out fighting battles. He is establishing the kingdom and seeing it to the height of its prosperity. And really, the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings are Solomon's story. Unfortunately, um, it's a sad story because going from chapter 1 through chapter 8, where we are currently at, we are seeing Israel reach the height of, of its heights. And then starting in chapter 9, we're going to see things begin to crumble. So then in chapter 11, we're going to see things totally fall apart. Where we are at currently in chapter 8 is literally the peak of Israeli history up until our current day in the 21st century uh, when it comes to faithfulness to God and general prosperity. Right? Right here in chapter 8, we see Israel as close to the kingdom of God as it has been and as close to the kingdom of God as it will be until Christ comes back and establishes the kingdom. So this chapter is a huge, important chapter, hence why I broke it up over two weeks. Because this is like a really big one that I really want us to marinate in it and reflect on it. Because it's just really good. But it's going to make it really heartbreaking whenever things go badly. And for the last few chapters, what we've seen is that Solomon, picking up after his dad dies and everything like that, he's been making the kingdom flourish. Solomon has a whole lot of money. He's got a lot of allegiances and like, like he... He's just very good from a political perspective when it comes to establishing the kingdom and making alliances, all that stuff. And he is great at architecture, right? He hires all the best people to really just create some massive infrastructure throughout the land of Israel. In the last few chapters, we've seen him particularly focused on building a palace for himself and a palace complex, and in particular, for building a palace for God. This is what we know as the temple which 1 Kings likes to call the house of Yahweh. And we have seen Solomon building the temple for a few chapters. And once we get to chapter 8, we see Solomon dedicating the temple. And like I said, we're starting in verse 22 today, but I figured the best way to recap the context of 
the first half of chapter 8 is maybe to at least read through it, right? Uh, and so, um, could I have you read verses 1 through 21 for us? I know it's a lot. Uh, okay. But I'll have you read verses 1 through 21. I'll briefly summarize it, and then we'll go into our new stuff today. Sound good? All right. So, 1 Kings chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's households of the sons of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh from the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves to King Solomon at the feast, which is in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. Then all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the Ark. And they brought up the Ark of Yahweh and the tent of meeting and all the holy utensils, which were in the tent, and the priests and the Levites brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel, who congregated to him, being with him before the ark, were sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or, or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of Yahweh to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the house, to the holy of holies, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim made a covering over the ark and its poles from, from above. But the poles were so long that the ends of the poles could not be seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses laid there at Horeb, where Yahweh cut a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Now it happened that when the priest came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of Yahweh, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of Yahweh filled the house of Yahweh. Then Solomon said, Yahweh has said that he would dwell in the cloud of dense gloom. I have surely built you a lofty house, a place for your dwelling forever. Then the king turned his face around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, who spoke with his mouth to my father David, and has fulfilled it by his hand, saying, Since the day that I brought my people from Israel from Egypt, I did not choose a city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there, but I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. And it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. But Yahweh said to my father David, Because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who will come forth from your loins, he shall build the house for my name. And Yahweh has established his word which he spoke. And I have been established in place of my father David, and sit on the throne of Israel, as Yahweh promised, and have built the house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And there I have set a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of Yahweh, which he cut with our fathers when he brought them from the land of Egypt. Perfect. Alright. Um, so, what we see here is uh, really this amazing procession uh, where the temple becomes the house of God, right? Because up until this moment, the temple has just been a building, right? It has been stone stacked upon stone, gold inside the walls. It's been a nice building, but a building. This moment right here is the reason why the temple becomes significant. <coughs> the verses that Sean just read are the reasons why the temple mount is significant to this day. The verses that Sean just read are the reasons why Jerusalem is significant to this day. It is because this is the place where God chose to put his name, right? If you go way back into the time period whenever the people of Israel were wandering through the wilderness, God promised them that he was going to choose a place for his name to dwell, right? Up until this time period, though, God has been dwelling with his throne in the Ark of the Covenant, right? So the Ark of the Covenant has been basically a portable throne of Yahweh. He had not chosen the place yet. Here's where he chooses the place. And Solomon explains why, right? He explains it's because David chose it, right? What, like, that's so, like, what a privilege, right? Where you're the person who decides where God dwells, right? David chose Jerusalem, and therefore God says, I choose Jerusalem because that's what David decided, right? And so here we have the temple built in Jerusalem. God comes to the temple, and the ark goes in there. And from this point forward, the ark ceases to really be the throne of Yahweh. Going forward, the temple is the throne of Yahweh, right? And that's why we talked about this two weeks ago. 
The Ark of the Covenant is never mentioned again um, in the Bible after this. It's mentioned again in First Chronicles and stuff, but chronologically speaking, um, it's detailed, like the First Chronicles and stuff is detailing the same events, right? First and Second Chronicles. And so after this point, the Ark of the Covenant just kind of fades from like being mentioned, right? And it seems like the author recognizes that the Ark of the Covenant disappeared at some point, right? Because he mentions that the poles of the Ark of the Covenant are there to this day, but he doesn't mention that the Ark is, right? And if it had been stolen or something like that, we might expect that he would mention that event in the text, but he doesn't. It seems like the people of Israel recognized that the Ark of the Covenant had fulfilled its purpose, and now the temple is the throne of God. And what's really cool is that eventually... God's going to leave the temple, and it's going to be a heartbreaking moment. And then you're going to wonder, where is the temple of God, right? Because for a while, the throne of God was in the Ark of the Covenant, and then it was in the temple, and then it leaves, and you're like, what the heck? And then Jesus shows up, and Jesus is a temple, right? He is literally like, like he is the living temple, the living, breathing temple who goes, where he goes, God goes, right? And then whenever Jesus leaves... He makes us the temple, which is cool. But then what I love about this is that whenever you actually get to the new heavens and the new earth, it is no longer the Ark of the Covenant that is the temple. And it is no longer the temple that is the temple. The whole city of Jerusalem itself is the throne of God, right? And so you see like it's like expanding, right? It's the Ark and then it's the temple and then it becomes the whole city of Jerusalem, right? That becomes the throne of God. And at that point, the whole earth becomes his temple, right? Uh, which is just really neat, right? And so uh, whenever you're reading the Bible, the good question to ask is, where is God's throne, right? Where is God establishing his throne at, right? And that's always a good thing to ask at any point throughout the story. And so right here, we get to see God make his dwelling place in Jerusalem. Um, and Solomon seems to be the one presiding over this whole thing, which is interesting because there are a lot of priests here right? Uh, and this is a very, it's like a worshipful event. And so you would expect that the priests are the ones leading it, but that's not what we see. Um, and, and because of that, I wanted to read something before we actually jumped into the text itself today. Um, this is from that commentary I've been quoting quite a bit lately. Um, I just like some of the stuff he has to highlight here. Uh, and one thing he begins to talk about is the relationship between Solomon as a king and how he kind of fits a priestly role. Because this isn't something that is unique to the people of Israel, but the way that Solomon's doing it is different than how other cultures would do it. Right? So I want to read this. Sacral kingship is standard fare in the ancient world. Kings are often believed to be virtual incarnations of a deity or at least sacred personages. Israel's politico-religious system differs from this common ideology at crucial points. First off, the Israelite king is not considered a god. And secondly, Israel's kings are not priest kings with access to the sanctuary. Uzziah's attempt to usurp the priestly privilege ends with his complete exclusion from the temple because of leprosy. That's in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. A, quote, separation of church and state, or, uh, or better, of king and priest, was built into Israel's monarchy. Right? So there is a separation of church and state. Right, A king is not a priest, a priest is not a king. Yet, as is evident in 1 Kings chapter 8, Israel's kings preside at religious festivals, and the architectural arrangements of Solomon's palace show that the king is a human representative of Yahweh. Though he was not a priest, the king of Israel is not a secular figure either. Right? I really just thought that was interesting, um, because what he's highlighting in the commentary is that whenever you look at other cultures, it wasn't uncommon for the king to be viewed in a religious light, right? In some cultures, the king was literally viewed as a god himself, right? Whenever you look at the Egyptians, the pharaohs view themselves as gods, right? Whenever you look at um, even the Roman Empire, right? Um, like there was a, like, like whenever, like Augustus, like Caesar Augustus, he was called the son of God, but the reason he was called the son of God <laughs> was not because it was talking about the creator of the universe. It was saying he was the son of Julius Caesar. And he was called son of the divine Julius, right? Because Julius had been kind of esteemed to God levels, right? 
And so in ancient cultures, it wasn't common, uncommon for kings to be viewed as gods. But that's not quite what we see here, right? There is a clear distinction between Solomon and God, right? He is not claiming to be a god. Well, in other cultures, you would see kings functioning as priests, right? To where a king and a priest, like they would, they, there'd be a blending of religion and politics. But that's also not what we see here, right? To where Solomon, he is not the one offering the sacrifices, right? He is not the one entering into the temple, right? Only the priest can do that. And so Solomon has his limitations, and we've seen what happens whenever a priest, and whenever a king doesn't do that, right? Remember King Saul, right? King Saul, he tried to blend those lines. It did not work out well for him, right? King Saul, he offered a sacrifice, and Samuel rebuked him for it, right? And so what, what I just think is very interesting here is that the king is not a priest, and he's not a god, but he does have a religious function. And that, once again, highlights something I've tried to highlight as we've gone through First and Second Samuel and First Kings, is that being the king of Israel is not an easy task. Because it's, you're, you're having to be the king over a people that already had a king, right? God was supposed to be their king, right? And so you're, like, your job is kind of hard to define, right? Like, what exactly is the king's role, right? That's really what we're trying to figure out here. And really, I think that what we see, what the Bible's trying to argue for, is that the king is supposed to be to Israel what Israel is supposed to be to the world. Right? Uh, and in order to understand this, you have to go way back to Genesis. Right? In Genesis, God created man in his image. Right? We were supposed to reflect God. However, because of sin, we chose to fracture that image. To where, yes, we are still image bearers of God, but we're not reflecting him as we should. Well, God picked Israel to be one nation from the rest of the nations to do for the world what man was supposed to do. Right? So Israel was supposed to be the image of God to the world. Right? And that's why God is holy, and he says, you are to be holy as I am holy. You are to be a kingdom of priests. Right? Israel is supposed to be set apart, and they're supposed to be the image of God to the world. Well, now the king is supposed to be the image of God to Israel, so that Israel can be the image of God to the world. And that's why at this point in the story of the Bible, what we see is that basically the fate of Israel hinges not upon the people themselves, but upon the king. Right? If the king is being faithful then Israel will prosper. If the king is being wicked, Israel will not prosper. And that's because what the king does is basically going to dictate what the people do, right? And so the king, he's not a priest, he's not God, but he does have this religious role, right? It's hard to define, but we see Solomon doing it right here, and I think he's doing it perfectly, right? He is orchestrating the sacrifices, and he's getting everything in motion so that the priests can do their job, and he's not stepping on their toes, but he is making it clear that his reign is a reign under God, right? He might be the king of Israel, but God is the king over him, right? And so I think what we see here in chapter 8 is really the, perf like the perfect example of what Israel's kings were supposed to be. And I just wanted to highlight that because I want us to note what Solomon's doing in this chapter. Because this really is what the kingship was supposed to be. Right? So we really do see Israel at the height right here. This is the height of the kingdom. This is the height of the monarchy. This is the height of the kingship itself. Uh, and it obviously it happens at the dedication of the temple. That being said, let's go into the actual text we're going to cover today. Let's start verses 22 to 26. Okay. Then Solomon stood before the altar of Yahweh, before all the assembly of Israel, and spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said, O Yahweh, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or upon earth beneath, keeping covenant and loving kindness to your slaves who walk before you with all their hearts, who have kept with your servant, my father David, that which you have promised him. Indeed, you have promised with your mouth and have fulfilled it by your hand, as it is this day. So now, O Yahweh, the God of Israel, keep with your servant David, my father, that which you have promised him, saying, you shall not have a man cut off from me before me who was to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your sons keep their way to walk as you have walked before me. So now, O God of Israel, let your word truly endure what you have spoken to your servant, my father David. Very cool. Um, all right, anything sticks out to you all there? Also, while you all are looking at that, be thinking of something to look at. Um, Pastor Rob just texted me, and he 
told me, like, he just mentioned that Arlen's got sold, and he was like, how does that affect Sean and Brianna? <laughs> I just think that's so funny that yeah, everybody funny. knows about this. Like, I would have never known, but he, he literally just texted me that. All right. Um, anything stick out to y'all? It mentions how he kept his covenant. Yeah. yeah. No, like, notice how much of this language is steeped in the promise that God made to David. Uh, and really, the last verses were, too. We talked about that two weeks ago. Um, it's almost like Second Samuel 7 are super important verses, which is why I tried to emphasize that whenever we went through the passage back <laughs> months ago. Uh, all right, let's walk through it. Then Solomon stood before the altar of Yahweh, before all the assembly of Israel. You remember the word assembly there? We talked about it. Um, in like so, in, well, if you translate it, or I don't remember if it was this word or congregation. Uh, I think it, it, it I think you said congregation, like but it was actually the assembly. Yeah, let me check. I don't want to say it wrong again because I said it wrong last time. Um, one of the words, either assembly or congregation. Uh, one of them, I just think it's cool that it just so happens to be the same word that we translate as um, church, right? I think it might be congregation, but uh, it's church. this is kahel, I think it's church. right? Uh, let me look. The Septuagint. Da, 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 da. It is. Oh, okay, cool. Is yes. Crazy. So uh, if you go to the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, um, the word for assembly there is ecclesia which we translate as church, right? So you could very well say, then Solomon stood before the altar of the Yahweh before all the church of Israel. Um, but the reason why is church just means assembly. It's a gathering, right? Um, and so if you want to belong to the church of God, you have to realize that's not an individual thing. By definition, belonging to the church is belonging to a collection of people. Okay, so Solomon stood before the altar of Yahweh before the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands towards heaven. Um, this is something worth highlighting. Whenever the Bible talks about prayer, uh, we have to realize that the way that we pray nowadays is very different than how most people have prayed, historically speaking, um, like for all, for all time. Um, especially in the Bible, right? Because whenever we think about praying nowadays, notice we always say, bow your head, close your eyes, fold your hands, you know, dear Lord Jesus. This is like, this, this is how we always do it, Right? This is not, historically speaking, how people have always prayed, right? And if you go to Israel nowadays, this is typically not what you will see people doing, right? Um, most often, the posture of prayer is standing up on your feet, arms outstretched like this, right? Like, it's not looking down like this. It is looking up to the heavens and crying out to God, right? Um, this is why it's so significant. Whenever Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, it mentions that he fell on his face and cried out. This lets you know how much anguish he was in, right? He's praying to God, but he is not in the posture of prayer, right? He is on the ground crying out, right? Whereas for us, like, and I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I'm just saying that this is, typ this is what was typical of prayer back then, right? Nowadays, we all just like kind of, I don't know, we, we like close in and like, you know, close our eyes. There's nothing bad about that, right? But I think there's something beautiful. Like imagine like if that's what we did every time we prayed, Dear Lord, like if we all just stood up and like, like I don't know, just there's something kind of cool about that. Yeah. Uh, and there's something especially cool about Solomon himself doing this, right? You, you think about nowadays, like obviously America is not Israel and we don't want to mix the two up like a lot of Christians try to do, right? But I'm going to reference the American government just to make a point real quick. Uh, a lot of times we do have, you know, like whenever like a pastor is inaugurated or something like that, They'll hire a preacher or a pastor or somebody to come in and pray for the like pray for the president and something like that, right? Did I say a pastor is inaugurated? Mm -hmm. I meant to say president. Uh, whenever a president is inaugurated in office and stuff like that, a lot of times they'll hire a pastor or a preacher or something like that to come in and pray for them. How cool would it be though if whenever the pa like whenever the president is induct like like inaugurated, that he stands up there in front of everybody, holds his hands out and says, dear God, help me guide this people. That'd be pretty cool, right? And America's not even like, you know, we're not a Christian country, right? Uh, but that would still be really neat, right? Honestly, it'd probably be even cooler because we're not a Christian country. Um, but this is sending a message, right? There are priests who could lead the prayer, but instead King Solomon himself stands there before all the assembly 
and he spreads his arms out. And what he is about to do is he is about to drop down one of the best prayers in the history of the world. Uh, and what's really cool is that it's also the longest prayer in the entire Bible. Uh, we're going to be in it for pretty much the entire chapter. Um, but it's so beautiful. It is, hands down, one of the best prayers. So he stands before the altar of Yahweh, before the assembly of Israel, spread out his hands towards heaven. Keep in mind, uh, it probably smells like a barbecue there. Um, because they just, like, they sacrificed so many animals on this altar that they stopped counting. Right? And so you can see, like, you can imagine, like, the smoke of God's glory just descended into the temple. The smoke of their sacrifices are ascending up into heaven. There's flames. It smells amazing. And then Solomon stands there, and his voice booms out before the congregation. And he says, O oh, Yahweh, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or upon earth beneath, keeping covenant and chesed to your slaves who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept with your servant, my father David, that which you have promised him. All right, so what does he say? How does he start off his prayer? Making known that he's the only God above and below. Yeah. God's holiness. Yeah. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? <laughs> it's almost like Solomon's following the same structure. Right? Uh, that's how he starts. He starts by looking to God in heaven and talking about how holy he is and how set apart he is. O Yahweh, God of Israel. Right? Yahweh is the God of all, the I am that I am, but he is specifically the God of Israel. And he says, there is no God like you. Right? This isn't to say that there's no other gods, right? The word God in Hebrew is just Elohim. There are a lot of Elohim, right? Uh, many of the other nations worship these other Elohim. But there's no Elohim like God, like Yahweh himself, the creator of the heavens and the earth. There's no God like you in heaven or upon the earth beneath, right? So you can search all of the heavens and find all the Elohim there. You can search all the earth and find all the Elohim that are wandering on the earth. None of them is comparable to Yahweh. Which is true no matter what. And there's plenty of ways why you could highlight this is true. But what specifically does Solomon mention as the reasons why Yahweh is incomparable? Isn't it his, isn't it his covenant? Well, there's two things he highlights. One of them is the covenant. And the other is... Hesed! Hesed! Yes! <laughs> My favorite word, loving kindness, hesed. Right? So Solomon lists two reasons why God is incomparable. One of them is because he keeps his covenant. Right? First off, he's probably incomparable because of the fact he makes covenants. Right? Uh, most of the other gods, whenever you actually look at how they interacted with their people, they just like treated them like slaves. Which is interesting because Solomon calls the people slaves of God. But the connotation of slaves is very, it's much more positive. And how Solomon uses it. Right? Whereas, if you look at how the other gods treated their people, the people were afterthoughts. Right? They were just slaves to do their bidding, to do their will, um, and receive nothing in return. Whereas, God is a God who makes covenants, who desires a relationship, and when he makes a covenant, and when he gives his word, he is faithful to fulfill that. Right? Whereas, if you look at the other gods, like you can see this in Greek and Roman mythology especially, Right? They're petty and they're flighty, just like humans. They'll say one thing and they'll do another. They're deceptive. They're tricksters. God is not like that. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. So that's one way where God is unparalleled and incomparable. The other way is his hesed, right? his loving kindness. Right? God is a God who loves to give people what they do not deserve. And that which they have no right to expect. This is who God is. You go back to Genesis 1, and this is how the story started. He creates the heavens and the earth, and he gives it to man. He's like, this is for you. Have fun with it. Have dominion. Fill the earth. Multiply. Enjoy it. This is who God is. Right? He gives them a garden. He gives them every tree that they can eat to their heart's content, except for one. Right? This is just who God is. And even whenever they sin, he doesn't immediately destroy them. He still gives them an opportunity to repent and be faithful and redeem themselves along the way, right? This is who God is. He keeps his covenant, and he has hesed. You keep covenant and loving kindness, 
to your slaves. Right? Why do you think Solomon used the word slave here? Because they serve him. It's because they serve him. But why is it so significant that he keeps his covenant and his hesed towards slaves? Because they were slaves, like to Egypt. Well, they were slaves in Egypt, yes. But also, they have nothing to offer him in return. Yeah. Right? It's one thing if you keep your covenant to a king. Well, yeah. I mean, of course you would. Right? I mean, think about it. Right? If I made, like, you know, if the President of the United States walked in here and he asked me to do something and I made a promise to him, I'm probably going to make sure that I fulfill that promise. If some homeless guy came in, you know, I, if I told him I was going to do something, I'd like to think that I keep the promise, but we typically don't take those things as seriously. Right? We usually, like, we mean our words more significantly whenever we talk to somebody who we value more highly. Right? God keeps his covenant even to his slaves. Right? The people of Israel, they're slaves. They're not kings. They're nothing. But he keeps his covenant to them. And he gives gifts, not just to the royalty and the noble and the rich people. He gives them to slaves. Right? So I think that's why he uses that word. Right? We're nothing but slaves, yet you do all this for us. Keeping covenant and loving kindness to your slaves who walk before you with all their heart. So there is a condition. Right? He's going to keep his covenant with the slaves who walk before him. Right? If they're not walking before him, well, the covenant is not going to belong to them, is it? Mm -hmm. Right? The hesed is not going to belong to them. They're going to be punished for it. Were you guys in the Rocky? They only uh, get God's love and kindness if they walk with all their hearts. Yeah. Well, so they might receive loving kindness if they don't, but they're only guaranteed it if they do. Right? For those who do walk before God with all their hearts, hesed is going to follow them all the days of their life. This is what David says in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and hesed will follow me all the days of my life. Right? He knows this because he's going to walk before God. Right? God loves giving stuff to people no matter what. But the only way to guarantee that you're going to have his hesed is if you walk before him. But not only has he kept his covenant and loving kindness to all the slaves, but he also kept... Um, let me just read it. Okay. Keeping covenant and loving kindness to your slaves who walk before you all their hearts, who have kept with your servant, my father David, that which you have promised him. So what is the other thing that he lists that shows how awesome God is? The fulfillment of, it, the fulfillment of his promises. Specifically, what promises? He's talking about like the Davidic covenant. Yeah. He's saying that like someone will reign from... David's line forever, and Solomon is now reigning, and God's coming to dwell in the temple, and so it's showing that like things are going well, and God is upholding that, because he's literally dwelling in the kingdom of Solomon. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, he's literally looking at it, and to be fair, it hasn't been that long since God made this covenant, right? Mm -hmm. It's been, like, what, a few decades? Mm -hmm. Right? But still, I mean, we're only one king removed from David, mm -hmm. but Solomon's looking at it, and he says, you're doing what you promised. Right? I am on the throne. There's peace in the land. And you have come to dwell in your temple. This is all the type of stuff that you promised to David. And I see it. And I'm amazed. Because you didn't have to do that. Right? Yes, David was a king. But there's a lot of stuff David did after God made that covenant that would have given God plenty of reason to abandon it. Right? Remember, God made the covenant to David before the whole David and Bathsheba thing. Right? So, God could have abandoned it. But instead... Who ended up on the throne? Bathsheba's kid. Right? The only reason Solomon exists is because of David's sin. Mm -hmm. Right? David, like, the first child of Bathsheba died. The second child of Bathsheba is Solomon. So the only reason Solomon exists at all is because David sinned. And that sin gave God ample reason to forget the covenant. But God didn't. He kept it. And Solomon's enthroned. And the people dwell in peace. Despite the fact that it was not very peaceful for the end of David's life, was it? Right? And so he looks and he says, you've kept your covenant with your servant David. Indeed, you have promised with your mouth and have fulfilled it by your hand as it is this day. Right? He promised with his mouth, fulfilled it with his hand. Um, whenever you get to the book of James or whenever you get to um, the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus and James say, let your yes be yes and your no be no, what they're really telling you to do is to let your character be like God's, right? 
let your hands do what your mouth says it's going to do. Right? Don't say one thing and do another. Right? It's not saying you can't make promises. God makes promises. God swears oaths. So whenever it says, don't swear by heaven, well, God himself swears by heaven. Right? It's not saying you can't do that. It's saying that you want to be the type of person that is like God. To where somebody could stand there and say, what you said with your mouth, you did with your hands. Right? And what you promised in the past, you fulfilled in the future. Right? That's what type of person you want to be. Right? You want to be somebody like God. So now, O Yahweh, the God of Israel. I love that he keeps calling him the God of Israel. Because the portrait of God is as like the most powerful and amazing God. And the fact that this God would choose of all the nations of the world, tiny little Israel. He could have chosen Egypt. He could have chosen Assyria. He could have chosen Babylon. And he would have more reason to because they're more prominent. Instead, he chose tiny little Israel. I mean, that's cool, right? Yahweh, the God of Israel. Keep with your servant, David, my father, that which you have promised him saying, You shall not have a man cut off from me before me who sits on throne of Israel, if only your sons keep their way to walk as you have walked before me. So what does he do there? So, so what does Solomon do there? With his prayer. So he talked about how God fulfilled, has fulfilled the promise in the past. What does he ask him to do now? For him to keep fulfilling the promise in the future? To keep fulfilling it, yeah. Yeah, it's just a transition, right? You have done this in the past. I'm asking you to keep doing what you're doing. Um, this is just a worthwhile thing to do. Whenever you're praying, um, if you never know what to pray to God, a surefire thing that you can do is just ask God to remember his promises, Right? Figure out what promises God has made and which ones apply to you and pray for those, right? For us, probably the one that the early church picked up on that is the clearest is that Jesus is going to come back. So what did the early church pray? Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. That was their prayer, right? They said, you made this promise, fulfill it, right? And this is what you see throughout the Bible. The best prayers... Or just telling, asking God to fulfill his promise. And most often the promises that it's focusing on is about the kingdom. Right? You go to Jesus' prayer, what does he say? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Right? Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom want, come, your will be done. Once again, it's like Solomon's following the same thing. He says, God, you are holy. You have established the kingdom. May you continue to establish the kingdom. And then we do the same thing. Right? We say, God, you are so holy. Come, Lord Jesus. Right? Establish the kingdom. Right? So that's probably a surefire way to pray to God. If you don't know what to pray about, pray about that. Right? And so he says, you did this in the past, and I'm asking you to keep doing it now. Keep with your servant David, my father, that which you have promised him. So David is dead and gone, but God can still keep doing something for David. Right? Because the promise that he made to David was not only true as long as David lived. It extended to the future generations. He said, You shall not have a man cut off from before me who is to sit on the throne of Israel if only your sons keep their way to walk as you have walked before me. What is he quoting? I think a chapter in Deuteronomy. Nope. What's he quoting? We already talked about it. You shall not have a man cut off before me. God is talking to David. It's the covenant. It's the Davidic covenant, right? 2 Samuel 7. Same thing. We already talked about this, right? Yeah. This is where God told him this. He said, you will not have a man cut off from the throne, but there's an if statement there, isn't there? It's not just a blanket statement. It says, you shall not have a man cut off from before me who is to sit on the throne of Israel if... Only your sons keep their way and walk as you walk before me. So there is a way for the kings to be cut off from the throne. What do they have to do? Not do what they're supposed to. Stop walking before God. As long as they are faithful to God, the king will sit on the throne. 
However, if the king ceases to be faithful to God, the same thing will happen to the king that is going to happen to the people. It's going to happen to the people if they stop being faithful to God. If you go back to Deuteronomy, what happens to the people if they stop being faithful to God? He's not going to fight for them and provide for them. Yes, and in the long run, if they don't repent, what's going to happen? Famine, all the bad things you can Famine do. and stuff, and then eventually, if it keeps getting worse, what's going to happen to them? The exile. Kept exile. Them. Kicked out of the land. All right, so if the people stop being faithful, they get kicked out of the land. If the king stops being faithful, he gets kicked off the throne. However, God is faithful, and he has promised them that if they repent, he will bring them back to the land, which follows that if the king becomes faithful again, he will be returned to the throne, mm. right? Uh, and so that's what Solomon's praying for here, right? Do what you have promised. As long as we're being faithful, keep us on the throne. However, this is a bit sad whenever you read the rest of 1st and 2nd Kings. Because what we're going to see is that they're not going to be faithful. So now, O God of Israel, he doesn't even mention his name there, right? O God of Israel, let your word truly endure what you have spoken to your servant, my father David. Right? Um, everybody else called David King David. Solomon, he just says, your servant, my father. Because the only king in Solomon's vicinity is God. Right? You are the king. David was simply a servant of the king. He might have been called king by everybody else, but he was just your servant. That leads us into verses 27 through 32. <clears throat> but will God truly dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your slave and to his supplication, O Yahweh my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which your slave prays before you today, that which your eyes may be open, that your eyes may be open towards this house, night and day, toward the place of which you have said, My name shall be there, to listen to the prayer which your slave shall pray toward this place. And listen to the, to the supplication of your slave and of your people Israel, when they pray toward this place. Listen in heaven your dwelling place. Listen and forgive. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath, and he comes out and takes an oath before your altar in this house, then listen in heaven and act, toward, and act and judge your slaves, condemning the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by bringing him reward according to his righteousness. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. Right? Like it's um, preluding the uh, Lord's Prayer. Yep. There's certain common elements in all really good prayers. All right. So, what do y'all see here? Anything to stick out to y'all? I think it's cool that uh, uh, he says that the highest heaven cannot contain him. You know, contain... Yeah. I think verses 27 through 30 are probably my favorite verses of the entire prayer. I say that now. We'll see. <laughs> Maybe later on I'll be like, yeah, never mind. I love these verses. So his whole thing is he's been, he's really been praying for the kingdom, right? But Solomon is not, like, he has no mistake about, like, like he's praying that the king will sit on the throne. But... Solomon ultimately knows that it's not the king who makes the kingdom special, right? Not the little K king, right? It's the capital K king, God himself, who makes the kingdom special. And so he turns his attention from the, the human king sitting on the earthly throne to the heavenly king who just came to sit on the throne that is the temple, right? And he says, but will God truly dwell on earth? That's a good question, right? And it spans just this chapter. If anything, I would say that's really the question that drives the entire thrust of the Bible, right? Will God really dwell on earth, right? You start asking that question in Genesis. By Genesis 3, it does not look very good. Mm -hmm. And as you keep reading through it, it does not look very good at all, right? Chapter 8 is the closest to yes that we get up until Jesus, right? 
Because, yeah, we had him in the tabernacle and stuff, moving around, but all those people were grumbling, and they ended up being in the desert for 40 years. But right here, God has literally made his permanent abode in the temple. And Solomon asks the question that everybody's asking. Will God truly dwell on earth? Could this be true? Like, will you really live here with us? Right? That, that's the surprising thing, right? It's not that he would live on earth. It's that he would live here with us on earth. Right? Because we're the ones who always mess it up. Will God truly dwell on earth? But beyond that, the issue is that the earth is too small for God. Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. He says, God, even if you weren't confined to the earth, the, the highest heavens can't contain you. Right? You span, like, whenever you look at the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 40, it says that God spans the heavens, right? The word for span refers to the distance from your thumb to your pinky, right? The entire known universe, hundreds of billions of galaxies, all fits within the span of God's hand, right? And the whole point is that he's infinite in size. So Solomon's right. He says, the highest heavens can't contain you. You're too big. Much less the earth. And if the earth can't contain you, how much less this tiny little house I built? Keep in mind, this house is like the third of a length of a football field. It's tiny, right? It's, it's super small compared to a lot of buildings nowadays. And he says, how are you going to dwell here? Right? The fact that you would dwell here, like that's what's blowing his mind. Right? It is literally the God who spans the universe, who has chosen to make his dwelling place in this tiny little house that he put together. No wonder he lined the walls with gold. He says, hey, it ain't much, but I did what I could. Right? He spent billions of dollars on this thing. And he says, it's not much fit for a king, right? We talk about how it's crazy that Jesus would be born in a stable. Solomon's over here being like, I'm surprised that you're content with this, this like amazing billion dollar palace, right? This is like, our view of God is really too small sometimes. Yeah. Solomon's is exactly right. Will God truly dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven can't contain you. How much less is how time built? He has no mistake, right? He doesn't think that he's accomplished a great task. Later generations are going to look back at Solomon's temple and be like, nothing has ever come close to that thing. Solomon looks at it and says, I don't know. Is, does this kind of, is this okay for you? Right? He's like, I know it's not much, but I tried my best. Right? What's that song like, you know, the Brandon Lake gratitude? I know it's not much, but it's, you know, what other mm -hmm. lyrics go? I know it's not much, but it's something that's fit for a king. Uh, yeah. It was not much, but I have nothing else fit for a king. Oh, there you go. Th yes, there, that's perfect, right? Yeah. I know it's not much, but I have nothing else fit for a king. Right? Solomon's like, I tried my best. But um, I did my best. It wasn't much. <laughs> He's like, I, I tried my best. Mm -hmm. Will you really do this? Right? I mean, like, he's like, this is like a one-star hotel compared to where you could be at. Are you sure you want to dwell here? I mean, I'm glad to have you, but I know it's, I know it's not what you deserve. Yet have regard to the prayer of your slave and to his supplication, O Yahweh, my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which your slave prays before you today. Who is the slave he's talking about? Himself. 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 Right? Yeah. Imagine this, right? Here you have the king of Israel standing before all the people of Israel. Right? These are all the leaders of Israel, the priests, the people. And you have King Solomon, the wisest man on earth, the richest man on earth, the most popular man on earth. He is standing here with his arms stretched wide, looking up into the heavens, and he calls himself a slave. This is sending a message to the people. Right? This is what the king was supposed to do. He says, God, I'm just asking you to hear me. Anybody else... Like, if Solomon spoke, all they could do was hear him, right? We literally have stories in the Bible of people traveling across the world to hear the words of Solomon. But as Solomon speaks, he just says, God, will you lend your ear to my prayer? Right? This is a dude who is accustomed to people literally spending millions of dollars to travel over to visit him. And he just wants, he just wants God to hear his prayer. Right? Have regard to the prayer of your slave and to this supplication. Listen to the cry and to the prayer which your slave prays for you today. He's like just, um, that reminds me of the Phil Wickham song. I'm just singing a lot of songs today. Um, They're good. The, um, 
What is the song? If I may be so bold to ask you, will you lend your ear to me? Oh Lord, come quickly. Right? Um, and that song is about chasing your heart like David did. Right? I will run and I won't quit. Chasing your heart just like David did. Right? I'll come running through the gates, look into your face. Ooh, I can hardly wait till you carry my soul away. Right? That's what that song is about. But it's the same thing. If I can be so bold to ask you, will you lend your ear to me? Solomon, the richest, wisest, most popular man on earth, asking God to just lend him his ear. Mm -hmm. This is the view of God we need to have. That your eyes may be open toward this house night and day, toward the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, to listen to the prayer which your slave shall pray toward this place. Here's some theology for you. Where did God just come to dwell? In the temple. In the temple, right? God <laughs> came to dwell in the temple. But now, verse 29, Solomon says he wants God's eyes to ever be on the temple, which implies where is God at? Heaven. <coughs> in heaven. In fact, if you look at the beginning of the prayer, he says, O Yahweh, God, in heaven. Where is God at? That seems inconsistent. A few verses ago, it said he came to dwell in the temple. Now Solomon says that he's in the heavens. It says that God is in the temple, but then Solomon says the highest heavens can't contain you. So is Solomon outside, I mean, is God outside the temple or inside the temple? Both. Yes. He's everywhere. Uh, a lot of people, they object to the idea of the Trinity because they suggest that that was something that was made up in the New Testament. No. This is something that Jewish people were totally content with. Right? God can be in multiple places at one time. He is transcendent and above all things, yet he is also imminent, and he can make himself known. Right? Notice that it never really says that Yahweh is in the temple. It says that the name of Yahweh dwells in the temple. Interestingly enough, if you actually just like look at the phrase, the name of Yahweh, throughout the Old Testament, a lot of times it is what we would come to associate with the second person of the Trinity, a.k.a. the Son of God. Right? Uh, and so, um, in many ways, it's Jesus coming to dwell in the temple, right? Uh, so he says that your eyes may be open toward this house night and day, toward the place which you have said, my name shall be there, to listen to the prayer which your slave shall pray toward this place. And listen to the supplication of your slave and of your people Israel. So he doesn't want only his prayers to be heard. He wants all of Israel's prayers to be heard as well. This is once again a good king. Right? He's not just saying, hey, God, hear me. God, hear your people as well. Even the lowly peasant, hear their prayers. When they pray toward this place, right? a lot of times people of Israel, will, they'll, they'll do what like Muslims do with, um, you know, when Muslims pray towards Mecca. Well, Israelites will do this as well. They will pray towards the temple a lot of times, right? and especially in biblical times. Nowadays, there's not a temple there. When they pray toward this place, right? So, uh, like, and you'll see this like in Jonah. Right? Whenever Jonah is sinking into the depths, remember it says whenever Jonah gets into the belly of the fish, he, pray, he sings a song to God. Mm -hmm. And he says, Then I looked to the temple and I prayed. Then I looked to the temple. Well, he's not, I mean, he's literally sinking in the depths, so he was not actually looking towards the temple. It's not like he's like sinking through the water and he's like, Ooh. He's, you know, he doesn't do that. But the idea is looking towards the temple is looking to the presence of God. Right? That's what Solomon is saying the people do. Right? He doesn't want God to listen to their prayers when they're looking elsewhere. He wants God to listen to their prayers when they're looking to him. Listen to the supplication of your slave and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Listen in heaven your dwelling place. Wait a second, but he just said that you made your dwelling place on earth. Right? Verse 27, but will God truly dwell on the earth? <laughs> Verse 30, Listen in heaven your dwelling place. Where is God dwelling? Is he dwelling in heaven or on earth? Yes. Right? I'm just highlighting this because you're, the word Trinity might not show up in the Bible. But the theology that leads to the Trinity is in the Bible. Right? God is dwelling in heaven and on earth at the same time. Right? Listen in heaven your dwelling place. Listen and forgive. That's interesting. Why does he throw the word forgive in there? Because his people have sinned, they need forgiveness. Yeah, it's interesting that he never really mentions that though in there, right? He just mentions, we need forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Speaking of forgiveness, he goes on to talk about people sinning. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath, 
and he comes and takes an oath before your altar in this house, then listen in heaven and act and judge your slaves, condemning the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by bringing him reward according to his righteousness. What is Solomon ultimately asking God to do here? Give justice to his people. Yeah, that's the ultimate thing that he's praying for. Right? Um, ultimately, who is the earthly person who's supposed to render justice? The king. Solomon. The king. Right? And so this ultimately is the king's job. But why is Solomon asking God to do this? Like you said earlier, God is the capital K. Yeah. Yeah, the idea is that the king cannot do this unless the capital K king enables him to do it. Mm-hmm. Right? Because Solomon, remember, like, it's the idea, like, Solomon is the wisest man on earth, but he realizes that his wisdom, comes like, it comes from God. Right? And so if the king is to render justice, it's only because God is allowing him to render justice. Right? Uh, and we have to realize that the things that Solomon is praying for are going to be things that happen perceptibly from natural means, right? It's not like, like Solomon is not asking that whenever a man sins against his neighbor and stuff like that, that a voice boom from heaven and say, this is what you should do. No, what Solomon is praying is that God will give the human judges the faculties and the wisdom and the discernment necessary to render justice. Right? So that when those people do it, ultimately the credit doesn't go to them, the credit goes to God. Mm-hmm. Right? So he's asking God to let there be justice in the land. Right? This is the same guy who asked God for wisdom. Right? It's the same logic. Right? If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath, and he becomes and he comes and takes an oath before your altar in this house, listen in heaven and act and judge. Right? Let you hear the oath. You act and you judge. Condemning the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by bringing him reward according to his righteousness. How is the wickedness and righteousness going to be repaid? Well, it's going to be through the human judges. But he's saying, God, govern them, right? May you preside over the human judges and teach them between right and wrong and help them discern the proper verdict to arrive at, right? Uh, And this is really... This isn't just a prayer for the people who are being tried. This is a prayer for the judges themselves, right? That they would be upright people to render justice. He doesn't even mention the judges in the words that he talks about, but it's ultimately what he's praying for, right? He says, let there be justice in the land. Let their, let the people who govern the land not be driven left or right by their own selfish desires, right? May they not be driven by... Greed, may they not be driven by power, may they be driven by a desire to render justice. Right? Like that really all of that falls under this one prayer right here. Right? May there be justice. And may all the things necessary to produce justice be put in place. Mm-hmm. Alright? Do y'all have anything y'all want to add to that? I was gonna say that the way that Solomon is like structuring this prayer is a lot like whenever he talked to God and asked for wisdom. Because like even at the beginning he acknowledges how he was faithful to David, and then he acknowledged how he's continued to be faithful to put him on the throne. And then he, like, basically, like, showed a lot of humility by saying that, like, I am in, like, no position to lead your people. The same way here, he's saying, like, how he is a slave to God. And then he asked for wisdom to be able to do it. In the same way, now he's asking for, like, wisdom and for God to listen to them. So mm-hmm. it's, like, structured in a very small way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's intentional by the author, like how they structure it to show the parallels. Because it just highlights Solomon's character, right? Because these are, those are both shining moments for Solomon, right? Him asking for wisdom and him doing this. Like these are, these are high, like these are great moments for him. It makes him look really good, right? Verses 33 through 36. When your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you, If they turn to you again and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this house, then listen in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you gave to their fathers. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you and they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, then listen in heaven and forgive the sin of your slaves and of your people Israel. 
Indeed, teach them the good way in which they should walk. And give rain on your land, which you have given to your people for an inheritance. Perfect. <clears throat> so, I don't know if you've noticed this, but Solomon doesn't seem to expect the people to be very good. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not unique here, right? Um, but especially if you know your Old Testament theology, specifically in the Torah, you'll realize that a lot of the stuff Solomon's saying here is driven by the expectation that the people will not be faithful to the law, right? And so that's why he said, be faithful to your covenant and forgive. Listen to your prayer and forgive, right? The reason he said forgive is because he knows the people are going to need it, right? right? And he begins the whole prayer by saying, God, it is so amazing that you keep your covenant, and it is so amazing that you have hesed, and now you begin to see why that's so amazing, because he might call the people God's slaves, but a lot of times they don't act like God's slaves. <coughs> they're supposed to be, and that is what they're called to be, but they don't really do that very often. right? More often, they are only slaves to their own desires, and they do what's right in their own eyes. Right? And that's what he's addressing. Right? So the previous thing was, God, let there be justice in the land. Right? Because the trajectory is going to be towards injustice. Right? Whenever a person sins... There's going to be a temptation to, to being unjust to where the wicked are going to be repaid with rewards and the righteous are going to be afflicted and punished, right? And Solomon prays, God, keep that from happening. May the wicked be punished and may the righteous be rewarded. And so he, he's trying to play, press, he's praying for like an inversion of human sin, right? Where human sins, where man sins, he's asking that God would overcome that. Right? Where sin abounds, he's praying that grace would superabound. It would abound all the more, to quote the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. Right? That's what Solomon's praying for. Right? I, uh, I don't know if this is necessarily the most important thing, but just the fact that he includes that to me also shows that, like this isn't just like merely like a moment of like an emotional high. Like It's a pretty sober type of prayer. Yes. So he's not just like a political person like multiplying words and like saying stuff to sound good before the people. Because this isn't, like, that's not really something you'd say to, like, sound good, I guess. Like, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. that's not something, something, that's not something Saul would say, because it's, yeah. like, kind of saying, like, oh, by the way, like, everyone in front of me, like, they're going to be unfaithful at some point. Yeah, this is where everybody's shifting uncomfortably, because they're like, is he talking about us? <laughs> yeah. So, like, I don't know, I just thought I'd mention that. No, that, like, that's 100% good. It yeah. shows that, like, Solomon's also acting very like sober-minded and, and and wise in this case. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't even thought about that, but usually, like, this is something that like nowadays people talk about getting like drunk in the spirit and just like you know get, getting caught up in the moment and just like babbling off prayers. But most often, those prayers will be very feelings-driven, right? It, and it'll be about, oh God, you're so amazing, and like it, there won't be a lot of content to it. Whereas what Solomon's saying here, like Sean's pointing out, is very intentional. Right? He is not simply saying positive things. He is praying for what the people need prayer for. He is saying the good, the bad, and the ugly. He says, God, we do not deserve for you to dwell here. It is amazing that you're going to dwell here. The highest heaven can't contain you, and we are so grateful that you're here, and it's amazing that you keep your covenant with us. But God, going forward, we're going to give you every reason to leave, and I'm praying that you won't leave us. And in fact, I'm praying that you will actually equip us to be better at not trying to kick you out. Mm -hmm. Right? So where we stray towards injustice, help us be just. Where we go this way, help us go that way. Right? Help us stay on the straight and narrow. Right? That's what he's praying here. And so, yeah, it is a very sober-minded prayer. It's, um, he's not simply just multiplying words, and he's not trying to look good. He is doing what a leader should do. And he is actually shepherding the flock, right? He is praying for the actual needs of the people, <coughs> right? Uh, whereas this is something that we just, not, like, sometimes even whenever we pray, um, we've, like, we kind of got into the habit of this. I just do it. I'm like, okay, I need somebody to pray for gratitude, pray for their group, stuff like that. But this is, like, where it's, like, literally, like, it's taking prayer requests almost, right? This is what we need. Let's pray for it, right? That's what Solomon's doing here, but for a general group. When your people, Israel, are defeated before an enemy... Because they have sinned against you, if they turn to you again and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this house, then listen in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you gave to their fathers. <clears throat> According to Solomon, what is the only way for the people of Israel to lose a battle? 
God. It's because they sinned against him. Yeah. Right? And that's because Solomon has studied the Torah. Right? That's how it works. According, so we're not only built off the Davidic covenant, we're building off the Mosaic covenant as well. Right? God made a covenant to Moses and the people of Israel. Well, he made a covenant through Moses, the people of Israel. And it said, if you are faithful to me, you will win battles. Right? If you are unfaithful, you will lose battles. Right? We have to realize that we are not under the Mosaic Covenant. And so whenever Christians try to apply that logic to our own lives, that's where we start getting into prosperity theology. Right? Ooh, I'm faithful to God, therefore things should go well. No, that's not how it works for Christians. For the people of Israel dwelling in the land of Israel, that is how it was supposed to go. Right? If you are faithful, you win battles. If you are not faithful, you lose battles. That's how it is. When your people Israel are defeated before an enemy, because they've sinned against you. Notice that he doesn't say... Should the time ever come when this happens, he just assumes it's going to happen, right? When your people, Israel, are defeated before an enemy, it's going to happen. They are going to sin against you. The thing that is hypothetical is if they repent. If they turn to you again and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this house, listen in heaven and forgive the sin of your people, Israel. Bring them back to the land which you gave to their fathers. Hold up, when did they get out of the land? <laughs> when did that happen in there? <laughs> well, if they, they're, they're in a state of being disobedient, so I'm assuming that they were already kicked out because they were defeated before an enemy. Yeah, well, I think that the implication is that Solomon doesn't expect them to repent very quickly, oh. right? Uh, because if you actually go to the Torah, you'll realize that whenever they sin... They might lose a battle here and there. Famine, like, like God's going to send them a bunch of warning signs. And then eventually, he'll take them into exile. Right? And Solomon says, all right, if they lose a battle because they sinned, well, whenever they turn back to you, bring them back into the land. It seems like Solomon recognizes that they're not going to repent immediately. They're going to keep on sinning until they're kicked out of the land. And then he says, okay, when they finally do repent, bring them back. So in between verses 33 and 34, Solomon recognizes that many generations are going to pass. Like, it's just kind of like an understood thing, right? Whenever they sin against you, it'll take a while for them to repent. So most likely, you're probably going to have to kick them out of the land. But when they do repent, hear them and bring them back, right? I just think that's kind of funny. Like, it's not a very optimistic view of man, right? Um, like, whenever you look at the Bible, it, it develops a very optimistic view of theology, right? The view of God, and a very pessimistic view of anthropology, like of man, right? Um, man is man is the screw up. God is the fixer, right? He's the one who restores things, and man always undoes that, right? But Solomon, once again, he prays, and he doesn't say, like, like he doesn't even ask for justice here, right? He prays for justice in the land, but here he says he's praying for mercy, right? He says, God, they're not going to deserve it. They're going to deserve to be kicked out. Right? They're going to deserve to lose the battle. But I pray that when they repent and they actually get their heads on straight, that you will hear them. Right? Don't, don't, don't render justice here. Render mercy. Right? Don't just follow the letter of the law. Follow Hesed. Right? Give them what they have no right to expect. Give them what they don't deserve. That's what he's praying for. Because he's taking care of the people. Right? He knows that the people are guilty. He knows they don't deserve it. But he says, God, we both know that these people never deserved it from the beginning. Right? We, like, we don't even deserve for you to dwell in this house. So if you're going to show us hesed by dwelling with us, will you show us a little more hesed whenever we just screw it up and get kicked out of the land? Just... And also, it's really interesting because we know that whenever they finally get kicked out of the land, what's going to be destroyed? The temple. The temple. Right? Was Solomon aware of that? I don't know. But I think it's interesting, like, if he was aware of that, right? I mean, I think that anybody would, like, just logically, it makes sense. If they're getting kicked out of the land, that means the land's getting decimated. He had to have known that this temple would be destroyed, right? So here he is dedicating this thing, and he's dedicated billions of dollars to something that he seems to know will one day be destroyed, right? He has dedicated years of his life to making sure that this is happening. There's this huge ceremony, yet he knows that this is heading on the trajectory where the people will get kicked out of the land. This will lie in ashes, but even though the temple lies in ashes, he's praying that God will not abandon his promises. 
that he will know that he has plans for the people, plans to give them a hope and a future, right? If you want the actual context of Jeremiah 29, 11. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Okay, so does, do you think that Solomon just knows the people really well? Or do you think whenever he talks like, kind of like futuristic, that there's like, God is giving him like somewhat of like divine wisdom of what's going to happen? I mean, it doesn't specify. I would think it would specify if God was like, giving him specific details of what's going to happen in the future, but since he asked for wisdom, is that like God is giving that to him kind of for him to be, I don't know, so confident to say that those things would happen? I'm going to say yes, mm -hmm. but I'm also going to say I don't think that is necessary in order for him to say these things. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that. So first off, I think that everything he's saying right here is what you would arrive at just by reading Deuteronomy. Right? So in Deuteronomy, Moses already makes this clear. Mm -hmm. Like, Moses makes it clear True. that, like, when you read Deuteronomy chapters, like, 27, 28 and stuff, yeah. he says, you're going to get kicked out of the land. Mm -hmm. You are going to set a king over you. Mm -hmm. Like, like he, he knows these things are going to happen. He laid it out. Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing is that Solomon studied the Torah. Right? When you read Deut Deuteronomy 32, it says that Israel is going to get so bad that God's going to abandon them altogether for a while mm -hmm. and take everything to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So I think Solomon knew that. And even right. in Deuteronomy, it says, like, whenever you get kicked out, if you turn your eyes back to God, you yeah. would bring it back. Like, it's almost the same kind of, like, wording. Yeah. Too. Well, yeah, so everything, that's what I'm saying. Like, everything Solomon's saying here, like, and in the paragraphs that follow, all of it is built off of specifically, like, Deuteronomy 28 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I think the main thing is that he studied the Torah. At the same time, Solomon is a prophet, right? He wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. He was the wisest man on earth. And, I mean, I've, like... I wouldn't even have to be a Bible scholar to understand that man is very good at screwing things up and mm -hmm. being unfaithful to God. Solomon's the wisest man on earth. So I think that he definitely would have arrived at that conclusion anyways. Uh, in addition to this, the fact that his prayer is being included in here tells me that in some way, as he is praying, the spirit is involved in it. Mm -hmm. right? And so I think that really all those components are kind of coming together here. Okay. Um, this is really that whole mystery of how inspiration of the spirit works. He moves on. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain, again, because they sinned against you, where is he coming up with this stuff? Why is he bringing up the heavens shutting up and there is no rain? I just mentioned where he's getting all this information Deuteronomy. from. Deuteronomy. Right? These are all things, if you go read Deuteronomy, this is what Moses says. Like, he, like, like he literally breaks down. He says, when you break the law, this will happen. And if you keep breaking the law, this will happen. And if you keep breaking the law, this will happen. He says, you're going to lose battles. And if you keep sinning, God's going to shut up the heavens and it's not going to rain. And if you keep sinning, I'm going to do this. So Solomon's literally just going through this stuff. It's literally built off of Deuteronomy. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, he's got, like, a scribe over here. And he's like, hey, what's up next? All right, cool. Like, like he's just, like, going through it, basically. <laughs> when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they've sinned against you, and they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them. So notice, who does Solomon view as being the one who afflicts the people of Israel? God. Right? Here he is praising God for his graciousness and his loving kindness, yet his theology allows for God to afflict. Not Satan. Yeah, it's not just Satan. It's God. Right? God is the one afflicting them. Your theology needs to allow for that. Right? God can do that. And that's okay. Right? God can be good and also afflict at the same time. If your theology does not allow for that, the issue is not with God or with the Bible. The issue is with the box that you've put God in. Listen in heaven and forgive the sin of your slaves and of your people, Israel. Indeed, teach them the good way in which they should walk. He's literally asking them to stay on the straight and narrow, right? Um, <laughs> teach them the good way, right? Jesus shows up. I am the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> Right? You go back to Genesis 18, and God explains why he chose Abraham. He says, I have chosen you to be a guardian of the way. Right? In Hebrew, the word is derek. Right? Um, it just means the path, the direction, the street, the way. Right? And God, Solomon's saying, teach them the way that they may guard it. Right? And give rain on your land, which you have given to your people for an inheritance. Nowadays, we complain whenever there's rain. Um, because we don't realize what it lo it's like to live in an agrarian society, right? Where every day you don't know where your food's coming from. And if it doesn't rain, 
famine hits the land. Right nowadays, I mean, the type of food we eat just doesn't even come from the ground. We just like make it in factories, and like <laughs> it's not—it's not even supposed to be edible, right? Well, like like the stuff that like you stuff you get at McDonald's. Oh no! I don't think any oh, of that no. stuff actually comes from nature. I don't know where they come up with that. But so we don't know what this is like, right? But imagine living in a culture where everything you eat comes from the ground. You depend on rain for survival. Well, God said, if you keep sinning, I'll shut up the heavens. There will be no rain. Well, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? And so he says, God, if they repent, give them some rain, please. So he's once again taking care of them. But he's also setting this trajectory where he, he, he seems to anticipate that this is a high point and things are going to go downhill. He realizes things aren't going to stay here, which is cool. Because for us, it looks like Solomon is almost establishing the kingdom of God. But Solomon doesn't think he's the Messiah, right? He realizes that there's one greater than him who's going to show up, who's actually going to make things right. He knows he's not the guy. He's just another guy paving the way for the guy, right? I'm just a dude playing another dude. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is what he's doing. <clears throat> All right, verses 37 through 40. If there is famine in the, in the land, if there is pestilence, if there is scorching wind or mildew, locust or grasshopper, if their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer or supplication is made by any man or by all your people Israel, <clears throat> each of whom knows the affliction of his own heart and spreads his hand toward this house, then listen and heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and give to each according to all his ways, whose heart you know. For you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men, that they may fear you all the days that they live upon the face of the land, which you have given to our fathers. So you notice that there's a repetitive structure to this, right? He's really just praying for one thing after another. He's going to pray for seven things, all in all, right? This is number, I think, four, maybe? Five? Is that right? Um, yeah. This is number four. Yeah. This is number four. Um, one thing I want you to notice here. What does Solomon present? In each case, what does he present as being the solution to the problem? Forgiveness. Well, yeah, but on man's part. What does man have to do? Repent. But how does he demonstrate his repentance? He knows the affliction of his own heart. Like yeah. the prayer and supplication? Prayer, right? In each of these, prayer is the solution. Which is interesting because if you were just reading the Torah um, from just like a by-the-letter thing, what would you typically think the solution would be? Like if somebody had sinned before God, what was the first thing you would typically go and do? Would it be confession? Well, like a sacrifice? A sacrifice. Right? A sacrifice is typically what you would think of. Right? Like, there's literally an entire sacrificial system. You go read the book of Leviticus, and there's like six chapters dedicated to how to make proper sacrifices. Do you know how many chapters in Leviticus are dedicated to prayer? Zero. <clears throat> Do you know, is there really any place in the Torah that teaches you how to pray? Not really. You want to know the first place where somebody teaches somebody how to pray? It's in the Gospels, where the apostles show up and they say, hey, teacher, teach us how to pray. So there's really no place in the Torah where God says, here's how you need to pray. Yet in each of these cases, Solomon says that the solution to their sin is not sacrifice, it's prayer. Why do you think that is? Is it because he just thinks that sacrifices are pointless? trying to talk more like about the heart versus like a physical action? I think 100% that's what he's getting at. Right? I mean, Solomon obviously loved sacrifices. At the beginning of this chapter, he offered so many that they couldn't count them anymore. He loves sacrifices. Yeah. But he realizes, <coughs> to obey is better than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I don't need your money. I want your life. Right? He realized that's what the whole point is, right? Hine shema mitzibah tov. To hear is better than to sacrifice, right? You want to hear God's words, and whenever you realize that you're guilty, 
You pray to God and pray that he will hear you. Right? The sacrifice is cool, but the sacrifice means nothing if it is not preceded by an honest prayer and supplication to God asking for forgiveness. Right? That's what Solomon recognizes. And notice specifically, he always emphasizes that the prayer has to be directed where? To God. Toward the place where God dwells. Right? Um, there's a direction here. Right? It can't just be empty words. It is prayer directed in the direction of God. And we talked about how the name of Yahweh, um, who is that typically associated with? Of the, of the Trinity. Who? God the Father. No. Uh, the Son, right? The phrase, the name of Yahweh, is usually associated with the Son. And so whenever you are praying, he's saying you pray in, toward the name of Yahweh, right? Toward your name. Well, whenever we pray, Jesus says, pray anything in my name, and it will be done for you, right? The idea is not simply saying the name of Jesus. It's the idea of being directed toward him, right? You're looking towards his will, Right? In the days of Solomon, you look towards the temple. In our days, we look towards Jesus. Right? That's what you're called to do. You look where God is, that is where you look whenever you pray. Because the whole point of prayer is to get close to God. Right? You go read the Psalms. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? David's whole thing is, I want to be close to God. And so whenever he prays to God, he is praying in God's direction. Right? And so I just want to highlight that because it's interesting, like... Everything Solomon is saying is built off of the law. Mm -hmm. But he's not mentioning sacrifice as being the solution. Mm -hmm. The solution is devotion of heart as expressed through prayer focused in the direction of God's presence. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. right? It lets us know that Solomon gets it. right? So if there's famine in the land, if there's pestilence, if there's scorching wind or mildew, <clears throat> locust or grasshopper, if their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, where is he getting all that stuff? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Yeah, that, that's, that's going to be the answer every time, just so y'all know. So you know, like, if, if y'all are like, trying to figure it out, it's not a trick question, that's the answer. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. If all this stuff happens, whatever prayer or supplication is made by any man or by all your people Israel, each of whom knows the affliction of his own heart. So there has to be an awareness of like, it can't just be like whenever like you say, I'm sorry, like you know, like whenever a couple gets into an argument and the couple, and one guy says, I'm sorry, and she's like, What are you sorry for? And he's like, I don't know, it just seemed like the right thing to say. That's not what Psalm is talking about here. Right? This is not simply a person being like, God, I don't know what I did wrong, but I'm sorry. That's not what this is. These are honest prayers for people who recognize their sin. These are people who say, God, I have turned from you, I have rebelled. And you can see that in what I've done here, 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 and here. That is the type of prayer Solomon's talking about. It's not just an empty prayer where you say, Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. No. It is a heartfelt prayer. They know the affliction of their heart. It's like they, a... Oh, sorry. No, like, go for like they would, I forget which psalm it was, but when David says, like, my sin is like before me, it's like, and it's like literally before him. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> my sin is before me. Right? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Right? Psalm 41. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Right? Pro uh, produce a right spirit within me. That's the type of prayer that Solomon's talking about here. And then, what does the man do? He spreads his hands towards his house. Right? There's a reason why this is the imagery of what they did like this. Whenever you pray like this, what is the imagery? A cross. Well, oh, not, not just a cross. Um, that is true. But what is the imagery of like spreading your hands? Going you're like this. Facing giving, up towards heaven. You're giving God everything. You're, re you're releasing it to him. Yeah. Right? Like this is what you're doing. You're releasing it. Right? You're praying to heaven and saying this is, this is to you. Right? You're directing everything you have towards the heavens. Right? Because normally we're so focused on earth. Right? Uh, awesome. My favorite two, whenever I think of prayer, my favorite two postures would either be this or bowing down. Because whenever you bow down, it's like you're laying your neck bare before a king, mm -hmm. acknowledging that he has the right to chop your head off if he wants. Right? You're just laying down. Yes? Oh, so it just reminded me of, like, when Jesus... I mean, I guess I guess he, I think he's also quoting, like, Isaiah or something. Mm -hmm. But the whole, like, you have, like, made this, like, a house of prayer. Yes. And the temple. That's going to become even more relevant in a little bit. Oh. Um, but, but yes, like, that's the whole thing, right? Jesus quoting that, and he's quoting the prophets, because, first and foremost, this temple is not simply a house of sacrifice. 
it is a house of prayer, right? And it's a house of prayer for who? All the nations, not just Israel. It's the God of Israel, but it's a house of prayer for all the nations. That's what Jesus was so mad about in that whole scene. Listen in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and give. That's a, he always says that. Forgive, act, give. Forgive, act, give. Right? So forgiving is, you know, cleansing them of sin. Acting is taking action. And giving is hesed. Right? Forgive, give. Forgive and act and give to each according to all his ways, whose heart you know. Right? God, don't just listen to the words of their prayer. Listen to the words of their heart. You know their heart. Right? That's the reason why my dad, David, was picked as king. Right? Because man looks at the outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. He says, you know their hearts, God. Hear their prayers and render to them according to their ways, the ways of their heart in particular. Right? What's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Who wrote Proverbs? Solomon. Solomon. Ah, it's almost like it's the same dude. Crazy. <laughs> Trust the Lord with your heart. He'll direct your paths. Wow, crazy. Whose heart you know. For you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. This is coming from the wisest man on earth. Wisest man on earth says only one person knows the hearts of men, and that's God. Amen. That they may fear you all the days that they live upon the face of the land which you have given to our fathers. Are they entitled to the land? No. Who gave them the land? God. God. Right? And so he says, let them keep the land. All right? We move on. Verses 41 through 45. Okay. <coughs> also concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, if he comes from a far country for your namesake, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and of your outstretched arm. So if he comes and prays toward this house, listen in heaven your dwelling place. And do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you, as do your people Israel. And to know that your name is called upon this house, which I have built. When your people go out to battle against their enemy, by whatever way you shall send them, <clears throat> and they pray to Yahweh toward the city which you have chosen, and the house which I have built for your name, then listen in heaven to their prayer and to their supplication, and do justice." See what I was meaning whenever I said that the whole house of prayer things would be relevant? Because it's called a house of prayer for all the nations. The very next thing Solomon prays for is for foreigners praying to the temple. Right? It's relevant. Right? 100%. Also, concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, if he comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and of your outstretched arm. Now that's interesting. <clears throat> Solomon has just been painting this entire thing as very negative. These people are going to fail. They're going to do all this horrible stuff. Yet, at the same time, he confidently says that Gentiles will travel from a far distance because they will hear about the name of God. How can he say so confidently that that's true? Where is he getting this information? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, right? It's all there. But in addition to that, in Deuteronomy, there's a reason why God afflicts the people. It's not just because he's mean. It's because whether the people are prospering or whether they're being cursed, God is getting the glory. If they are being faithful and they are being blessed, then they're going to give credit to God. And everybody's going to say, wow, Yahweh's good. If they're being unfaithful and they're being cursed, well, everybody else is going to look and be like, dang, Yahweh's powerful. Because they're not being faithful to him. And he got kicked out of the land. And so either way, God gets the glory. And so the people of Israel might stray, but Solomon recognizes that the Gentiles will hear of this. And what I also like is that Solomon is the king of Israel, but he doesn't lose sight of God's ultimate plan, does he? He realizes that God might be the God of Israel, and he loves that. But that's not God's whole goal. God's goal is to bring all the people to him. And so as Solomon prays, he prays as the king of Israel to the God of Israel, but he prays not just for Israel. He prays for everybody on the face of the planet. Interestingly, he kind of prays for us here, doesn't he? Because none of us are Jewish. I know some people think Sean is, but he's not. Right? Also, concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, 
Is anybody in here a foreigner who's not the people of Israel? All of us. If he comes from a far country for your name's sake. Well, hey, Ben and I went to Israel very recently. Right? I mean, there's no temple there or anything like that. And you really don't have to go to Israel. But the idea, the reason back then they would have come to the country for his name's sake is because they worship Yahweh. Well, is anybody here a Gentile who worships Yahweh? Yeah. Look at that. For they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arms. Has anybody heard of Yahweh's great name and outstretched hand and you know, all this stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> us. Right? This is us. This is really cool. If he comes and prays towards his house. Well, we're living in a time period where the house is gone. But who did I say that we pray in the name of now? Jesus. Jesus. Why? Because he is the temple. Right? And he has made us the temple. Wow. We are literally, like, this is, this is what Saul is praying for. If he comes and prays towards this house, listen in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all which the foreigner calls to you. If you pray in my name according to my will, it will be done for you. That's what Jesus is talking about. Same theology. In order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you. Why may they, should they know his name? To fear him. As do your people Israel. See, Solomon is to Israel what Israel is supposed to be to the nation. His prayer is supposed to be an example for Israel. Israel is supposed to be an example for the nations so that the nations can respond to God as Israel responds to God and Israel is supposed to respond to God as Solomon responds to God. Right? That's the logic of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. To know that your name is called upon this house which I have built. The Gentiles are supposed to know that God's name is called upon this house. Right? So even Gentiles are supposed to know that Jerusalem is significant because the temple is there. This is the reason. This verse right here. This passage. This theology. This is why Jesus was mad whenever he entered the temple. Because where the marketplaces were set up was in the area called the court of the Gentiles. Right? There was the, there was the Jewish court where only Jews could go. And there was one place where Gentiles could come to worship God. And the Jewish people had turned that place into a marketplace. Mm-hmm. That's why Jesus was mad. It was not just because they were charging money and stuff. He was not mad just because of the commerce. He was mad because there was one place on earth where Gentiles could come and worship God. And the Jews had deprived them of it. And so he starts flipping tables and he says, it was said this house should be a house of prayer for all the nations. You've turned it into a den of robbers. Jesus ticked off because the Jews have deprived the Gentiles of a place to worship. That's what Solomon's talking about here too. right? Solomon and Jesus have the same heart in this issue. It's not just about the Jews. It's also about the Gentiles. That was the ultimate trajectory of this. When your people go out to battle against their enemy, by whatever way you shall send them, so whenever they go out to battle to fight anywhere, and they pray to Yahweh toward the city which you have chosen and the house which I have built in your name, Listen in heaven in their prayer and their supplication and do justice. So whenever they go out to fight and they pray towards you, do justice. Do what you think is right. A.K.A. make them win. Right? Because the just thing to do would be to make them win because God promised that's what he would do. If they're being faithful to him, they're going to make them win. Therefore, it would be unjust of God to not make them win because God would be violating his own promises. Make sense? All right. Verses 46 through 53. Good luck. (laughs) When they sin against you, for there is no man who does not sin, and you are angry with them, and give them over to an enemy, so that they take them away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near. And if they cause these things to return to their heart, in the land where they have been taken captive, and return and make supplication to you, in the land of those who have taken them captive, saying, We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly. And if they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul and the land of their enemies who have taken them captive and pray to you toward their land which you have given to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and the house which I have built for your name, then listen in heaven your dwelling place to their prayer and their supplication and do justice for them and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions which they have transgressed against you 
and give them over as objects of compassion before those who have taken them captive, that they may have compassion on them. <coughs> for they are your people and your inheritance, which you have brought forth from Egypt, from the midst of the iron furnace, that your eyes may be open to the supplication of your slave and to the supplication of your people Israel, to listen to them wherever they call to you. For you have separated them from all the peoples of the earth as your inheritance, as you spoke by the hand of Moses, your servant, when you brought our fathers forth from Egypt, O Lord Yahweh. Good stuff. <coughs> what story is he referencing here? The Exodus. Exodus. Exodus, yes, very good. Um, like, oh, light bulb come on. Yeah. <coughs> um, so one thing, I, I just wanted to look this up just to make sure it was correct. Um, <laughs> The word for exile, is, which shows up a few times in this chapter here, is the word Shabbat, right? Uh, and a very closely related word is the word Shub, which is to turn or to return, right? And interestingly, um, there, there seems to be a little pun, like a play on words going on here. What is the solution to exile? It is turning to God, right? Uh, but... The word turn in Hebrew, it can be a metaphorical turning or it can be a literal turning as well. And so, either way, the, ex, the, like, the solution to exile is returning, right? But the only way to return physically is if you return spiritually, right? Because that's the order, right? First off, you spiritually exile yourself from God, so he sends you into a physical exile, right? You have to spiritually turn to him and he will physically return to the land. Right? Uh, and the words are literally just one letter off from one another. Right? Uh, and so I just think that's really cool. Like, that's kind of like the running uh, play on words throughout this whole chapter. Um, because that's what Solomon keeps going back to. All right. Uh, something then? Say something? Okay. <coughs> when they sin against you, for there's no man who does not sin. He keeps going back to this. Right? The idea is he expects this is going to happen. When they sin against you, for there is no man who does not sin, and you are angry with them. And give them over to an enemy, so that they take them away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near. So what's he referring to? Exile. Exile, right? They're going to go off into exile. And if they cause these things to return to their heart in the land where they have been taken captive, and return and make supplication to you in the land of those who have taken them captive, saying, We have sinned and have committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly. So if they're taken off into the land, and they realize why they're there, Right? It's one thing to be carted off into Babylon. It's another thing to realize that the reason you've been carted off is because of your own sin. Right? Because they just might think, oh, but like, I I'm sure a lot of them thought, oh, maybe God's not as powerful as we thought. Right? No, God is as powerful as he thought. That's why during the exile, God sends prophets to say, I sent you here. I allowed the Babylonians to do this. Right? It's not like the Babylonians overpowered me. No. It's not like I forgot you. No. I remember you, and I know what I did. I sent you off into exile because you sinned. Solomon says, if they realize that they've sinned, and if they return to you with all their heart, and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, who have taken them captive, and pray to you toward the land which you have given to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and the house which I have built for your name. Right? So here they are in exile, and they turn back to Jerusalem. And they pray towards the place where the temple was at. It won't be there at that time, but they're praying in that direction. Listen in heaven your dwelling place to the prayer and their supplication and do justice for them. Forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions where they've transgressed against you. Give them over as objects of compassion before those who have taken them captive, that they may have compassion on them. That's interesting. So what does he pray? What is he asking God to do? Turn their hearts back to him. After yes, but what is, like, in addition to that, more specifically. In general, that's what he's praying for all these prayers. But what does he pray specifically about the, cap, like the, the people who took them into exile? That he allowed them to do that. Yes. But the enemies have compassion on Israelites. Yeah. He says, turn the Israelites into objects of compassion. 
right? These people took them into exile, right? Which means that these people do not like the Israelites, right? Typically, you don't destroy cities and burn down buildings of people that you like, right? So they have taken the Israelites as slaves and as captives. And he says, but while they're in captivity, God, turn them into objects of compassion. Miraculously do your works so that the people who took them captive and the people where they're dwelling at, make them look on your people with compassion and make they, may they treat them nicely, right? Sure enough, whenever they go off into Babylonian captivity, you're going to see this, right? Think about like Daniel. Shout out Meshach and Abednego, right? These guys are being afflicted at first, but in the end, they end up being favored by some of the Babylonians, right? And they end up being objects of compassion. Later on, when the Persians overtake the Babylonians, the Persians are going to have compassion on the people and send them back home, right? That's what Solomon's praying for, right? May God set in motion the events which ultimately lead to them returning, right? Uh, let, let there not need to be a war, right? Like, don't make it so that the Israelites have to rebel. Do what you did for them back in Egypt. Remember, the Egyptians were afraid Israel would rebel. Mm -hmm. But it, Israel didn't have to do that, did they? Yeah. No. God showed up and took care of it. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. Don't let Israel have to turn into an army that rebels against the Babylonians and Persians and runs away. No, because then they're going to chase after them. Work your wonders so that they let them go. Right? Make them objects of compassion. Mm -hmm. For they are your people and your inheritance, which you have brought up, from, brought forth from the land of Egypt from the midst of the iron furnace. Mm -hmm. So he says, you've done this before. Mm -hmm. Right? Do it again. Right? You have made them objects of compassion before, to be fair. Very reluctant objects of compassion. Pharaoh was very hard-hearted. But he says, you've done this in the past. Do it again. That your eyes may be open to the supplication of your slave and to the supplication of your people Israel to listen to them whenever they call to you. For you have separated them from all the peoples of the earth as your inheritance. So he realizes that the Gentiles have a part in this, but Israel is set apart, and they are special. They are God's inheritance. They are his. As you spoke by the hand of Moses, your servant, when you brought our fathers forth from Egypt, O Lord Yahweh. This is all built on Old Testament theology, right? It's built on the covenant to David. It's built on the covenant to Israel through Moses. It's all built on that. All right. We got two more slides. I know that we've gone a little bit long, but we'll get through. Now it happened that when Solomon had finished praying this entire prayer and supplication to Yahweh, he arose from before the altar of Yahweh, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread toward heaven. And he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be Yahweh, who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. Not one promise has failed all of his good promises which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. May Yahweh our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. May he not forsake us or abandon us, that he may incline our hearts to himself, to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. <coughs> and may these words of mine, which with, 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 with which I have made supplication before Yahweh, be near to Yahweh our God day and night, that he may do justice for his slave and justice for his people Israel, as each day requires, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that Yahweh is God. There is no one else. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to Yahweh our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments, as at this day. This is great. This is just so good. Like, this is such a good chapter. Um, so we got to the end of Solomon's prayer, right? But he's not done talking. And what I love is that at some point during his prayer, Solomon fell to his knees. We don't know when, right? At the beginning of the prayer, it said he stood before the people of Israel with his arms outstretched. Yeah. And then right here, it says, Now it happened that when Solomon had finished praying this entire prayer and supplication to Yahweh, he arose from the altar of Yahweh from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread towards heaven. We don't know when he fell down, but at some point he did. And I just love that, mm -hmm. right? Because that tells us that even though this was a very thoughtful prayer, it was an emotional prayer, mm -hmm. right? And as he was talking, eventually at some point... He falls on his knees. Which, once again, I don't think he's doing this as a performance. But the message is being communicated to the people of Israel. Right? There's a reason why this whole thing is recorded here. It's because this is the ideal king. Right? Solomon's not going to be the ideal king. But for a moment, he is 
the picture of the ideal king, right? Standing and at some point falling to his knees, right? But not in some flashy way where it says, and then Solomon paused and fell to his knees. No, he was talking and at some point fell to his knees. And now he gets up and he turns around, right? Before he was looking towards the temple, he was setting an example because the whole prayer was about praying towards the temple. It'd be really weird if he was praying in a different direction, right? He's praying towards the temple, right? Right in front of the altar, you know, you see like, the, like all the stuff he's built, like the bronze sea and all that stuff. He sees it before him. And now he turns and now he stands as the mediator between God and man, right? The temple of God is behind him. He stands here and he is directing himself towards the people and he prays a blessing over them. He stood before the assembly, the ecclesia of Israel with a loud voice and he says this, Blessed be Yahweh, who has given rest to his people Israel. I'm going to look it up real quick. I can guarantee you that's the word shalom. Right? Verse 56, is that right? Mm-hmm. Let's see. It's not. No, I was wrong. This is the word menuach, a menuha, uh, which I'm assuming comes from the word noach. Um, so this is the word where we get like the name Noah from. Um, wow, I am surprised. That totally seemed like a place for them to put a pun, right? Because his name is Solomon mm-hmm. and Shlomo, like it, it'd be a pun. Um, I am so surprised that's not the word. Huh. This is why I wish we were just all reading Hebrew because... There's multiple different words translated rest and... Mm-hmm. Oh, well. Blessed be Yahweh who has given a rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. He promised them that he would do this and he has done it. Not one promise has failed of all his good promises which he promised by the hand of Moses' servant. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Not one. Right? The point is that God is faithful. May Yahweh our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Notice how the prayer isn't simply that God would keep them in the land, right? The main thing, the first thing he says, may God be with us. Because Solomon realizes that's what's important. The land, the temple, all that stuff, that is secondary. The main thing of primary importance is Emmanuel, God with us, right? May Yahweh our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not forsake us or abandon us, that he may incline our hearts to himself. Why is it that he wants God to be with them? Is it just so that they can be the ones to say that God of the universe is with them? So that their hearts can be to him, so yeah. they can worship him? They yeah. Change their hearts. May God be with us so that our hearts would be more devoted to him. Right? It's not simply, oh wow, look at us. We're the special people of God. No. God, be with us so that we'll be more focused on you. Mm-hmm. Right? Whenever you're far away, we might be distracted. Come so near that we can't avoid our hearts being inclined towards you. That he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. God, despite not being obligated to do so, has kept every single one of his commandments. Us, despite being obligated to do so, have not done that. Yet he has not forsaken us. So he says, may God stay with us And may he not forsake us so that we will keep following him. And so that amidst our sin, we will repent and return to him and learn day by day to obey him more. This is what we call sanctification, right? God, stay near to us so that we can be sanctified by you. And according to Solomon, there's no way to be sanctified if God is not with you, right? This is why we would say the spirit of God sanctifies us. Same way. And may these words of mine with which I have made supplication before Yahweh, be near to Yahweh our God day and night, that he may do justice for his slave and justice for his people Israel as each day requires. Give us each day our daily bread. Mm-hmm. Right? He says that prayer, the, the, those little words that I just prayed, I pray that God will keep those at his bedside and that he won't just hear them. I hope that he'll hear them on repeat every day and every night and that they'll be ingrained in his memory so that as each day requires, he will do this for our people that he will forgive us, that he'll incline his ear towards our prayers, that he'll help us be victorious in battle when we need to, and that he'll send us into exile when we need to, but that he'll never give up on us, right? That's what he's saying, right? He's not like, 
remember, the prayer was not only positive stuff, right? The prayer included the people being punished for sin. But he says, I pray that God will always hear that prayer. And that no matter how far away we go from him, he will never allow us to go so far that he won't receive us back. May these words of mine, which I have made supplication for Yahweh, be near to Yahweh our God day and night, that he may do justice for his slave and justice for his people Israel as each day requires. I just love that phrase, as each day requires. Yeah. The idea is that they, they need mercy every morning, right? Uh, <laughs> this isn't just like a one-day thing. Oh, yeah, you know what? Every month you're going to sin and you're going to need forgiveness. No. Every day, God's going to need to hear all seven of those petitions that he just said, mm-hmm. right? Every battle... Um, whether it's a physical battle out in the battlefield or a spiritual mm-hmm. battle that each private person faces, right, and a community faces. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that Yahweh is God, there is no one else. So why is it that Solomon wants God to keep the prayer close? Why is it that he wants God to keep being faithful to his covenant? So everyone can see the glory of God. So that the rest of the world may know. It's not just so that Israel can dwell secure And so Israel can be super duper special and be like, wow, look how amazing we are. He says, may God do all these things and may God hear my prayer for Israel so that through God keeping his prayer for Israel, all the peoples of the earth may know that Yahweh is God and that there is no one else. May those people who worship Zeus look away from Zeus and look to Yahweh. May those who worship Dagon look to Yahweh. May those who worship Baal look to Yahweh. May those who worship Allah look to Yahweh. May those who worship the one that they call Jesus according to the Joseph Smith tradition, may they look to the real Jesus and look to Yahweh. Right? That's what he's praying. Right? Um, you know that meme of like the distracted boyfriend? Right? Who's like walking with his girlfriend and he turns around and he's like, ooh, who's that girl? Oh, yeah. That's what Solomon's praying for the other nations. They're all following their other gods. But he prays that they will be distracted by what's going on in Israel and that they will chase after Yahweh instead. That's what he wants. And so he doesn't say, God, be faithful to Israel so that Israel can feel comfortable and secure. He says, God, be faithful to Israel so that the nations can see your faithfulness to Israel and know that you are the one true God. Because you may be the God of Israel, but they need you more than they need anything else. And so may all the nations come to you. I just love this. Like Solomon knows his theology. He knows the Torah well, right? Israel is set apart and Solomon acknowledges that. And he realizes that Israel is very unique in the eyes of God. But he never loses sight of the fact that Israel has a purpose. And there's a reason why Israel's unique. And it's not because Israel is just God's favorite. It's because God appointed Israel to serve the purpose of drawing all the nations to him. And so we acknowledge that Israel's special and unique. And we should love Israel. But their purpose was actually to bring all of us into the flock. That's just really cool. And this is the mystery that um, Paul talks about in the New Testament, right? When he talks about the mystery of God, it's like literally, like, it's there in the Old Testament. You just have to look. And once you recognize it, it's everywhere. You realize that it's always been about drawing all the Gentiles in. Mm -hmm. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to Yahweh or God. It says the word therefore, right? Whenever you see the word therefore, you ask what it's there for. Why is it that the Israelites should make sure their heart is wholly devoted to God? So that everyone else can see who God is. Yes. Israel should make sure they're wholly devoted to God so that God will be further inclined to be faithful to his promises so that the nations will be further inclined to follow Yahweh. Right? Israel follows God so that the nations will also follow Yahweh. Their purpose was evangelistic. Right? It was to spread the gospel to the nations. They did it in a different way than we do it nowadays, but that was the goal. Right? They were supposed to be set apart and follow this law and do these things so that all the nations would see and be like, yes, that's who we should follow. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to Yahweh our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as of this day. So he says, guys, look at this moment right now. This day, all of us are gathered here Y'all are facing the temple. You are praying and you are hearing me pray. May every day going forward be just like this day. If we could do this every day, the nations will come flocking to Yahweh. And this house will be a house of prayer for all the nations. That's the motivation. I think that's a really cool motivation for us too. 
Um, we shouldn't simply obey God just because we want to be goody two-shoes Christians. We should want to obey God because we realize that that is our apologetic, right? The way you defend your faith is by living out your faith and by being wholly devoted to him, right? It's not about having the best intellectual arguments. It's by demonstrating a faith that is like, by living a life that is directly hinging on being devoted to God. To where people look at you and they realize that every aspect of your life is different because you worship Yahweh. And they're like, whoa, I want some of what that guy's got. That should be how you defend your faith. And people should flock to God because of it. Or they'll reject him. That's up to them. But your reason for being wholly devoted should not just be self-focused. It should be because you want to be close to God and give him the glory to his name. And because you want others to come to God, because you love them, and because you want them to give him the glory to his name. Right? Final verses of chapter 8. Now the king and all Israel with him were offering sacrifices before Yahweh. And Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to Yahweh, 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the sons of Israel dedicated the house of Yahweh. On the same day, the king set apart as holy the middle of the court that was before the house of Yahweh, because there he offered the burnt offering and the grain offering, and the fat of the peace offerings. For the bronze altar that was before Yahweh was too small to hold the burnt offering, and the grain offering, and the fat of the peace offerings. So Solomon celebrated the feast at that time, and all Israel with him, a great assembly from Labo Hamath to the brook of Egypt, before Yahweh our God, for seven days and seven more days, even fourteen days. On the eighth day, he sent the people away, and they blessed the king. Then they went to their tents with gladness and goodness of heart, because of all the goodness that Yahweh had shown to David, his, his servant, and to Israel, his people. Very, very good. Um, one thing I like here. Notice it says, before Yahweh our God, in verse 65. I think this is the very first time the narrator himself has included himself in the story. Right? He's not saying he was there. But, you know, usually the only time it says Yahweh our God is when somebody's speaking. But here, he calls it Yahweh our God, uh, to where he's acknowledging that he also worships Yahweh. It's almost like he's so caught up in the moment that he's like, Yahweh our God! <laughs> I love it. Yeah. All right, we can summarize this a lot quicker because it's not the prayer as much, right? Now, the king and all Israel with him, so I love it, it goes back to just calling him the king, mm-hmm. right? The king and all Israel with him were offering sacrifice before Yahweh. So he's emphasizing prayer, but sacrifices are still a thing. Right? This chapter was bookended with sacrifices. Right? Sacrifice at the beginning, sacrifice at the end, prayer, 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 prayer in between. Right? Which is probably how it should be. Right? Worship begins and ends with sacrifice, and it's driven by prayer all along the way. And Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to Yahweh, 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. I just realized earlier, whenever I was saying that that was the word shalom, shalom is peace, I meant to say Shabbat. Um, oh, whenever yeah. I was thinking, whenever it says he brought rest, I was thinking Shabbat. Um, but that it actually makes more sense for Nuak to be there, because Shabbat would be a weird word to put there. I was, I had a brain fart, and when I said Shalom, I just, <laughs> when I just read peace there, and I was like, wait a second, Shalom is peace, not rest. It, they're closely related. Whatever. Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to Yahweh, twenty-two thousand oxen, one hundred twenty thousand sheep. Holy guacamole! That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So the king and all the sons of Israel dedicated the house of Yahweh. Yeah, what a dedication. Man, talk about a barbecue. Like, that is that's some good food. They put Baptist to shame. Yeah, they, they do put Baptist to shame. This is actually Solomon. This is how we know Solomon was a Baptist, right? right of course. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, you, you can't have a good worship assembly if there's no food involved. That's right. Amen. Um, so the king and all the sons of Israel dedicated the house of Yahweh. On the same day... The king set apart as holy the middle of the court that was before the house of Yahweh, because there he offered the burnt offering and the grain offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. For the bronze altar that was before Yahweh was too small to hold the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat of the peace offerings. This is how you know that it's successful, is that literally on the opening ceremony, you realize that you've got too much worship going on. Right? Like, he built this entire thing, and on the opening day, he realized that they had underestimated how impressive this was going to be. So it's not only the altar that is set apart for sacrifices. They literally had to expand it because there wasn't enough room just on the altar. 
Like, if, if they had just been sacrificing stuff on the altar, they would have been there for, like, months. He's like, all right, um, we're going to expand this, and sacrifices can also be made throughout the court. <laughs> so, like, it's not just one priest at the altar. It's, like, several priests everywhere. Like, they're killing multiple animals at one time because there's so many of them, right? So he had to expand it because it's, like, too much worship going on. Like, it, it's there's worse problems to have, right? It's almost like so many people showing up for a service that it's, like, you have to, like... Too full. Well, yeah, you have to, like, knock down the walls and just, like, all right, you know what, guys, we're just going to go worship out in the field because there's not enough room in the house. That's kind of what's going on here. It's like the, right? the, the paralytic through, like, the roof. Exactly, yeah. It's like there's too many people. Let's open up the roof, throw the paralytic down. So Solomon, Solomon celebrated the feast at that time and all Israel with him, a great assembly from Lebo Hamath to the brook of Egypt, right? All throughout the land, right? The, the whole extent of the kingdom had gathered here. Before Yahweh our God for seven days and seven more days, even 14 days. Um, we talked about this at the beginning of chapter 8. This is being celebrated during the Feast of Tabernacles, right? It's in the seventh month according to their time period, September, October time period. Feast of Tabernacles is usually how long? One week. It's usually one week long. Um, they double the lake because they're having a great time. They're like, yes, this is awesome. Also, this is really cool because God arrived at Mount Sinai at Pentecost, right? God arrives at the temple at the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, right? Which Tabernacles is literally, it, it's a dwelling place, right? It's literally like God's abode, right? So God literally comes to dwell with them. He tabernacles with them at Tabernacles, right? That's cool. But agriculturally speaking, uh, Pentecost is the feast of first fruits, right? It's whenever the first fruits, you know, start popping up. Um, and Tabernacles is the feast of the harvest, right? So what began at Pentecost now comes to its conclusion at Tabernacles, right? At Mount Sinai, God announced to them that he was going to choose a place to dwell. He has chosen that place, right? First fruits to harvest, right? The like the growing season has completed, right? Now it's time to reap the benefits of all this stuff, right? Now you can really see the Torah at play because up until then, they've just been wandering really, right? The Ark of the Gods has been transporting. Now God has a home. He has a permanent address. Very cool. On the eighth day, he sent people away and they blessed the king, right? Finally, he's like, all right, party's over. Everybody go. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you. They went to their tents with gladness and goodness of heart because of all the goodness that Yahweh had shown to David, his servant, and to Israel's people. Mm-hmm. Psalm 23, David said, Surely goodness and hesed will follow me all the days of my life. According to Solomon, David was right a few verses earlier when he said his cup overflows. Because goodness and hesed did not only follow him the days of his life. It followed him even afterwards. Mm-hmm. Even after David dies, the goodness of Yahweh is being shown to him. And everybody goes home, and they're happy. Not because the kingdom is flourishing, not because of that stuff, it's because Yahweh is faithful. That's why we should rejoice as well. Right? No matter how bad life's going, no matter how good life's going, we should rejoice because God is faithful to his covenant. He's faithful to his promises. And, he's come to dwell amidst his people. And will God dwell on earth? Heck yes, he will. (laughs) And we're going to be there for it. It's very exciting. Do y'all have anything y'all want to add? I know. Sorry we went long there. It's This is literally like, like I, I'm sad to be finishing this chapter. Like, I'm very sad. It, it, it bums me out majorly. <laughs> so, um, do y'all have any final thoughts y'all want to share before we wrap this up? Make sure you're following God's law. Yeah. Be devoted to God. Be faithful. No matter what happens. Good, bad, ugly. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, well, just to set the scene going forward, uh, one thing I want to highlight, this is just from the commentary again, I just like to highlight this stuff. I like whenever people smarter than me say stuff, I like to share it with y'all. Um, the seven prayers and petitions that Solomon prays, um, the co- author of the commentary, he sees a parallel between those prayers and like the future history of the people of Israel. Um, so talking about the prophetic element that you were talking about, um, that could be possible. Some of them seem like a stretch, but if you reflect on it, it makes sense. Um, whenever he talks about making an oath before the altar, 
Well, Sol, like he says that that's parallel to the reign of Solomon. Because Solomon, the first prayer he talks about is a person making prayer before an altar, and Solomon is praying before the altar when he says that. So the parallel will be the reign of Solomon. He goes on to talk about the people being defeated by their enemies, and that could be parallel to the divided kingdom that's going to come, right? When really their enemies are going to be themselves, and they bring about their own defeat. Uh, later on, he prays about no rain in the land, and whenever you get to the time period of Elijah, that's what you're going to see in the back half of 1 Kings. There's going to be no rain in the land. He talks about famine, siege, and plagues, and this is going to be stuff that we see going on in Samaria shortly before the northern kingdom is destroyed. He talks about foreigners praying, and this is stuff that we see whenever the northern kingdom does fall. He talks about being sent out to battle, this could be parallel to the last days of Judah, whenever they're fighting for existence. And then the last thing he talks about is a prayer about when they go off into exile. And they go off into exile. Hmm. Right? Uh, and so really, the prayers that Solomon goes through, it really does foretell the future history of Israel, which we're going to see throughout the rest of First and Second Kings. Right? And so really, this chapter does set in motion that whole thing. But also, it makes sense because it's literally just following the structure of Deuteronomy. Um, and I hate to be a negative Nancy in how I finish out this whole thing, but I wanted to quote the final verses of this just to let you know where we're heading for the rest of 1st and 2nd Kings. The story of 1st and 2nd Kings is the story of a rejected temple. A rejected and suffering Messiah and mediator, a temple destroyed but destined to be raised on the third day. A temple Christology thus works out in a narrative of cross and empty tomb. Um, what he means is, and throughout the chapter, he highlights the parallels between the temple and Jesus, right? Uh, and how um, what we see here in this chapter is that God is very comfortable with coming to dwell in a physical body um, amongst man, right? Here, it's a physical building, right? He will come and be a living temple when Jesus shows up. And whenever you read the Gospels, you read the story of a rejected temple. Right? Where God comes to dwell amongst man and man rejects him. Unfortunately, first and second kings isn't too different. Right? Here, we're at the part where Jesus is, you know, Jesus is accepted, right? This is the Sermon on the Mount moment, right? Where Jesus is gaining popularity and everybody loves him. Unfortunately, when you read the Gospels, it doesn't stay that way. Right? The people start turning against Jesus and they ultimately reject him. And Jesus is destroyed, right? He is killed. But then he's resurrected. Well, that's going to be the story of 1st and 2nd Kings. Right here is the high moment. Everybody's excited about the temple, and they're like, yes, the temple is here. But very quickly, they're going to turn against God. And by the end of 2nd Kings, the temple's going to be destroyed. But the way the 2nd Kings ends is with the hope of future resurrection. Because one day, the temple will be restored, and the people will return to the land. Right? So... Um, I just wanted to highlight that. It's kind of cool, the parallels that you see between um, not only the future of Israel short-term, but the future of Israel long-term as well. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. We praise you for your word. We thank you for giving it to us so that we can study it. Um, please be with us as we hang out with each other for the rest of this night. And um, may our conversation be glorifying to you. We love you. We praise you. To your name we pray. Amen.